This is another lesson in the series on finding the engram. And in this lesson, we'll focus on how memories might be linked. So we've earlier encountered the idea that memory can be analyzed at different levels. So we've got the system level, where a, an engram may be distributed over different brain regions. And then within brain regions, there are populations of cells. And we talked about this process of allocation, that uh, a certain population of cells may be processing whatever is happening, and then a subset of them will go on to become part of the engram to store the memory for that event. So we've got an allocation process in terms of which cells will become part of the memory engram, but also for each cell which synapses are involved in the memory. And we know that synapses undergo plasticity, so changes in the strengths of the connection, and that we called LTP. And the late phase of LTP required, it seems, uh, gene expression to make protein products that make lasting changes at synapses. We also encountered the idea that perhaps the initial uh, setting up of an engram involves early LTP processes. So the engram is sort of constituted by which cells are going to be sort of the, the population of cells that will store the relevant information. And then when those synapses are strengthened by late phase LTP, that makes the engram retrievable. So initially, the engram is a certain given population of cells and the pattern of connectivity between them. And then when the late LTP happens, those synapses are strengthened such that that same neural assembly can be reactivated upon memory retrieval. So in, in this lesson, again, we're going to focus on how might we understand the, the mechanism for linking memories together. Now, in previous lessons, we looked at some experiments that involved increasing the activity levels of the CREB gene in certain cells within a certain brain area. And cells that had elevated CREB activity were three times more likely to be allocated to the engram, in this case of a, of a fear conditioning uh, task. So the CREB activity seemed to be uh, related to which cells are going to be allocated to an engram. And we earlier learned that the CREB gene is just one of many genes that seems to be involved in synaptic plasticity. You'll recall the tag and capture model where recently active synapses are tagged and then they can capture plasticity related products to make lasting changes at the synapse. And the CREB gene is one of these genes involved in synaptic plasticity. So with that in mind, here is a sort of a story, a hypothesis about how memories might be linked. And in this case, we're going to look at temporal linkage of memories. So the event one is going to happen and then event two and how the uh, populations of cells may be able to link uh, the memories for event one and two so that the memory of event one can trigger the memory of event two and vice versa. So let's see how this CREB activity might give us a mechanism for linking memories. We'll start off with a population of cells here, and then episode A is happening, so some of these cells will become engram cells for episode A. Due to intracellular differences, for example, CREB activity, some of these neurons are more excitable than others. And this means that some of these cells, the ones that are a little more excitable, are going to be preferent preferentially allocated to becoming engram cells. The most excitable neurons respond. They are allocated to encode the episode, thus becoming part of the engram for episode A. And then, because they were recently activated by episode A, the boosted CREB activity sustains excitability for some time. So not only are these cells now becoming engram A cells, they retain some of their elevated excitability, which makes them more likely to be allocated to the next memory engram. So along comes episode B. Sustained excitability makes engram A neurons more likely to encode episode B as well. And so these cells then, in a sense, are linking the engrams of episodes A and B. Notice we'll color uh, the cells both blue and pink. So the blue cells were the engram A cells, but they retain excitability. So some of these cells will fire in response to episode B. Now, episode B has unique uh, aspects to it, so we'll get some other cells, the pink cells here, responding as well. But notice there's overlap. Some of the very same cells are part of the engram of episode B and episode A. Notice what this means uh, at a later time. 
if we retrieve the memory for episode B, we will be reactivating many of the very same cells that were the engram of episode A. So we're going to get the retrieval of episode A as well. We'll have a memory of B, and that memory will trigger the reactivation of the memory for episode A. So the retrieval of episode B activates many engram A cells, thus reactivating the memory of episode A. The memories of A and B are mutually linked. Now, if you think about uh, just sort of uh, why brains would do this, well, it makes sense to be able to link memories because things that are happening uh, in, in some sequential fashion are often related, and it also uh, uh, reduces the storage space necessary to encode these memories. So using overlapping neurons to store temporary related events is economical in terms of storage space, but it also gives the brain a way to link uh, to uh, subsequent events. Now, what we just uh, discussed was the above picture here. This is when episode A and B follow closely in time. We get the overlapping population of cells that links the memories. What if there's a longer delay between episode A and B? Notice then what, what will happen here is if there's a long delay, the, the elevated Krebs activity here will uh, diminish in time. So it will return to baseline after a while. And if episode B occurs after the return to baseline of the Krebs activity, then you're going to get a different population of cells responding to episode B. So you won't have as many overlapping cells. So again, if episode A happens and n-gram cells are, are allocated, so the blue cell cells are the episode A n-gram cells, um, however, because of the long delay, they no longer have their ele elevated Krebs activity. They've returned to baseline activity. So they're no more likely than other neurons in this population to respond to the new episode B. This means we'll have less overlap, so the engrams for A and B will share fewer cells the longer the delay between the episodes. And so now in this case, when we retrieve episode B, we're going to be activating the engram cells for episode B, and we will not be activating very many of the engram A cells, so we're not going to get the retrieval of episode A, we're just going to have episode B alone. So as the time between episode A and B increases, fewer n-gram A cells will take part in encoding episode B because n-gram A neurons have lost the excitability caused by activation during episode A. Episode B will not reactivate n-gram A. So the memory of episode A and B will be distinct, not linked. Now, this idea is illustrated in a recent uh, 2017 Scientific American article by Silva, uh, where they are showing that overlapping populations of cells are activated for temporarily near events. So let's say we have the mouse in cage A here. Seven days later, the mouse is uh, put in cage B, and then five hours later, cage C. So the B and C experience are close in time uh, compared to the uh, experience of cage A. Uh, here we see, using various tagging techniques, they are uh, tagging the neurons that are active for each cage experience. Now what they wanted to see was what kind of uh, overlap was there. Uh, were there some cells that were activated for both experiences? And if we compare cage A and cage C, we take the cells here and the cells here, and, and where are the overlapping cells? We get this, this number of cells here that were active for both KJ and KC. But notice, when we look at the, the pattern of overlapping activity for B and C, we get more significant overlap in activity. In other words, this is suggesting that um, many more of the similar cells were responding to cage B and cage C. And this supports the idea that exposure to cage B activates certain cells, but the elevated Krebs activity for these cells then makes them more likely to be allocated to the memory for cage C as well. And so the memory for cage B and C will show greater overlap because the duration, the interval here, is a, a shorter amount of time. When the interval is longer, it's going to be uh, unique populations of cells that will be encoding the engram for those experiences.